Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. This evening, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Joseph Lamana, the Jean M. and Joseph S. Silber Professor of Brain Sciences and Professor in the Department of Bio, uh, Physiology and Biophysics. Uh, Professor Lamana is an expert on blood flow and metabolism in the brain, on the adaptation to hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen. He served as president of several uh, learned societies, and it's my pleasure to welcome here here tonight to talk about the origin of mitochondria. Please join me in welcoming Professor Silber. Today, we're talking about uh, mitochondria. Um, and uh, it's going to be in three parts. Uh, the first is going to be uh, about the origin of life. We can't talk about the origin of mitochondria without talking about uh, the origin of life. You'll see why shortly. Uh, part two will be about the origin of mitochondria themselves. And then the three, we'll see how they had a role in uh, uh, the development uh, and evolution of multicellular animals. All right, so to begin with, we have to talk about uh, the time frame. So this is uh, the, called the biogeologic clock, and it breaks up the four plus billion years of Earth history into uh, a nice circle, uh, which uh, shows that for most of uh, the existence of the Earth, there was uh, not multicellular animals. So we have first is the uh, period here where the Earth is formed and it's uh, uh, beginning to uh, cool. And within a billion years or so, we have the origin of uh, life, the first evidence that life exists there. And then for most of the existence, uh, most of these billion years after that, there's not much in the way of multicellular life. So uh, the single cell life began almost as soon as the Earth was cool enough for life to occur. Um, so we're going to look at uh, when it began, the conditions under which it began, and some leading hypotheses about what generated life to begin with, and then what changed, how the conditions changed. Important to all of this is the consideration of energy. Uh, it's the b ability to generate, manipulate energy that defines life. The basic ingredients for life, once uh, the conditions cool on Earth enough uh, so that uh, the uh, chemicals remain stable. Uh, you need energy, which can be in the form of light, heat, or chemical energy. You need the chemical components. These are the, uh, these are the molecules, uh, organic molecules. They had to come from somewhere, uh, and they had to get there first. Uh, and then you need water. And so that's part of the conditions on Earth had to be cool enough for liquid water uh, to be available. So to get right to it, we have evidence from microbial mats uh, of uh, life uh, existing at about three and a half billion years. Uh, pretty strong evidence. We have the earliest physical evidence uh, at about 3.7, but we also have a theoretical uh, belief or th theoretical understanding that uh, life could have occurred in hydrothermal vents at about four billion years ago. And this is a description of the uh, eons of the Earth showing uh, these particular eons. You have the Hadean uh, uh, eon named for Hades, as you might expect, because apparently the conditions there are what we think of as hell, uh, with the sulfurous uh, volcanoes and bubbling molten magma. And then you have the Archean period, and this is the period under which life first arose. You have then a long period of time in the Proterozoic which uh, single cell life and the beginning of multicellularity, but not much in complexity. And then the Phanerozoic, which really means the obvious life uh, uh, period of time. Um, now, what we notice here, on, I would just want to mention this, this LHB is the late heavy bombardment. And that's a period of time when there were lots of meteorites uh, hitting uh, the uh, planet Earth. And these carried with it water. And they also, icy meteorites brought water. And also, meteorites carried organic compounds. 
And we know from uh, uh, the uh, meteorites that we've uh, uh, seen recently that th if we calculate how much uh, organic materials in a meteorite and how many meteorites there were, there's plenty of uh, uh, possibility for carrying most organic life uh, or organic compounds uh, to Earth by meteorites. And then you have the rise right at about 3.6, 3.7 of bacteria and archaea, which are the uh, prokaryotes. They are single-celled organisms. And they arose under conditions without oxygen. That's the most important thing. The atmosphere initially contained just hydrogen and helium. That's because most of the universe is hydrogen and helium. So when the Earth coalesced first, that was the natural uh, uh, compounds in the environment. They're too light to stay on the Earth, though. Earth's gravity cannot hold the light gases. And so both hydrogen and helium will leave the atmosphere reasonably quickly. And the atmosphere then becomes a mixture of what uh, comes out of the volcanic uh, vents, lots of, of volcanic uh, gases, uh, mostly steam and water vapor, uh, carbon dioxide, plenty of carbon dioxide, you have sulfur and nitrogen, plus the trace gases, the noble gases that don't react so much, the argon and neon. Uh, you have a little bit of uh, methane, a little bit of carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. Now what we were taught in school, uh, probably when you were to biology, you were taught the primordial atmosphere consisted uh, of hydrogen, ammonia, methane, water, and uh, hydrogen sulfide, which are the most reduced forms of the biological elements, uh, nitrogen, carbon, uh, uh, hydrogen, and uh, uh, sulfur, or oxygen and sulfur. This has to be uh, revised a little bit because under those conditions uh, that we now know to be present, there could not uh, be much uh, ammonia or methane. They would have been further uh, metabolized. But uh, so we add uh, nitrogen instead of uh, ammonia, and we add uh, carbon dioxide instead of methane. And the UV light will be breaking down some of the water vapor into a little bit of oxygen. But as soon as any oxygen will be made, it will react with uh, minerals in the crust of the Earth and be pulled out of the atmosphere. And the hydrogen that was left would also leave uh, uh, via um, the kinetic energy uh, in insufficient gravity. But the most important thing is that this was in a reducing atmosphere, no oxygen, or less than one part per million oxygen, very low oxygen. And it seems like that's a requirement for life to have arisen. Now, there's lots of theories on the origin of life. Uh, it's, uh, it's been discussed for uh, as long as people have been around. They've discussed origins. Uh, and you remember also from your biology about uh, theories of spontaneous generation and life from non-life that were uh, discussed uh, prior to people like Pasteur who showed that this was not possible. Uh, we had Darwin talk about the uh, warm little pond uh, which got sunlight, which had some organic chemicals and which life could arise from there. Uh, we had the experiments of uh, people like um, Miller and Urey and Fox, which took the elements expected of the primordial atmosphere, put electrical sparks in, and uh, got uh, organic compounds out of it. Uh, we also uh, have hypotheses where these organic compounds could line up on uh, uh, community clay. This is clay along the beach that would act as a place for uh, 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 to catalyze reactions among these uh, uh, compounds. Uh, the chili start hypothesis, which uh, if you had a, the snowball earth and a frozen seas, would protect the ocean from UV light and allow the chemicals to uh, uh, react uh, and, and form life. A radioactive beach hypothesis, this is radioactive chemicals along the shoreline producing the heat necessary to provide the energy for this. I mentioned meteorites being able to provide organic compounds. More recently, uh, they only were discovered in the 70s, some uh, hydrothermal vents, deep sea vents. Uh, uh, when these deep sea submersibles started uh, exploring the sea bottom, and they found these areas where obvious venting was coming from the sea floor, and lo and behold, there were things living there, uh, out of the sun, way out of the sunlight, at uh, uh, 100 atmospheres of pressure, at temperatures approaching 200 degrees C, and amazing. Uh, we call those extremophiles, that is, organisms that live in extreme environments. 
And these were uh, uh, these suggested to people like uh, Gunter uh, Wachtischauser uh, that life might have originated there, uh, making use of the iron and sulfur uh, minerals as uh, uh, catalysts. Uh, the, the black smokers had sulfide. They were very close to the magma and very hot. The white smokers a little further away, uh, a little cooler, a little more uh, alkaline. Uh, and there was hydrogen available to get energy from. And the idea that hydrogen metabolism may have been the first uh, energy available for life to arise. And of course, any or all of these might uh, be contributing. That is a multiple genesis hypothesis. Now, once you had these, uh, once you had life, uh, part of the chemical process using getting energy from uh, hydrogen and methane and carbon dioxide produced oxygen as a byproduct. So this is in a, in a reducing anoxic environment, oxygen being released as a waste product is a toxic product. So as the environment be, uh, gathered more and more oxygen, uh, the, uh, there would be uh, adaptations to uh, make use of this toxic waste product in a positive way. But before oxygen could accumulate, uh, it had to react with all of the reduced iron that was floating around in the oceans. The oceans were filled with a soluble form of uh, reduced iron, ferrous iron, and uh, as the oxygen came into the environment, it would react with the iron, oxidize it, and this is, well, this is rust. So you had to rust all of the iron in the, in the ocean, and uh, that iron doesn't, uh, it's not dissolved, it sinks. And so uh, these thick bands of, red bands of rust accumulated at the floor of the oceans. We call these banded iron formations. And it allows us to pinpoint fairly accurately when the oxygen was produced and when the uh, oxygen was accumulating in the environment. We know, and this is a banded iron, example of a banded iron formation from uh, the American Museum of Natural History in New York, but uh, there's an example in our Natural History Museum. It used to be out front. I don't know where it is now, but it used to be right out the front door as you walked in every day. <clears throat> so this indicates prodigious amounts of oxygen being generated during this three billion years ago to two and a half billion years ago. These banded iron formations are about two and a half billion years uh, old in the middle on average. Uh, and at the end of this period of time, we come to very close to our current atmosphere, which is an oxidizing atmosphere with one fifth of it being oxygen, the, most of the rest being nitrogen, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and there are trace uh, noble gases. Where did that oxidizing event come from? Uh, we call it the great oxidizing event, GOE. Uh, and the best guess here is the evolution of cyanobacteria. So these are bacteria, single cell animals, um, which we used to call blue-green algae when we were growing up, but they're not algae, they're bacteria. And they kind of look like this. Uh, this is a picture of a cyanobacterium. They grow in these mats. This is current mats that are available in uh, Western Australia. And those are layer upon layer of uh, cyanobacterial mats producing oxygen. Uh, these, uh, also these cells, these single cell bacteria became the precursors of the chloroplast, which is the organelle in plants that does photosynthesis and gives us oxygen today. So that's the precursor of all plants. And what happened then, the history of oxygen on Earth winds up this way, very low amounts for the first two billion years. The great oxidizing event occurs, but notice that this is a log scale. This is 1% of the current uh, uh, atmospheric level, that would 1% of that would be 0.2% uh, of uh, uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, not 20%. So 20% is what we have now. This is a much, still a very small amount. So for 2 billion years, oxygen was a very low level, and this is a time when uh, mitochondria started to uh, uh, produce 
multicellular animals. And uh, we will talk about the more current time period uh, for oxygen uh, in, uh, in part three. But right now, I'd like to uh, just summarize part one here and then stop for some questions. Uh, and the basic points that I've mentioned are that single cell prokaryotes uh, arise about four billion years ago in the absence of oxygen. And then cyano cyanobacteria begin to add oxygen, resulting in the great oxidation event 2.5 billion years ago as the environment shifts from no oxygen to some oxygen. One of the earlier slides you showed the meteorites, and one is huh. chirality. What do, what's the tie in there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the organic compounds that we use, uh, the sugars, the amino acids, uh, some of them are asymmetric. That is, they have a left-handed form and a right-handed form. And uh, the biology tends to use one or the other. Uh, in the carbohydrates, it's mostly the D form, the right-hand form. In amino acids, it uh, tends to be the L form. Uh, what hap what, uh, the chemically, they're exactly the same. So how did we get to choose one over the other? Because uh, biologically, you can only use one because enzymes are like a, a glove and a hand. You can't put a left-hand glove on a right hand. Um, and it turns out that in the uh, uh, meteorites, there's a chir chiral preference as well. It indicates that possibly we get the preference from the delivery of these uh, compounds from uh, space. Uh, because you can, you can look, you can, they've examined meteorites, for example, in Antarctica. That are in a uh, sterile environment, and then they they uh, they grow they they analyze them, and they find that they have organic compounds. Is it fair to say that the low oxygen level in the uh, early days uh, was basically until the uh, ferrous iron got used up and became uh, you know from a, a abundant to trace levels, and at that point the oxygen oxygen began. Yeah, uh, it would seem to be that the uh, that for the species present to survive, you had to remove oxygen somehow, and that, that that transition, not only in the percent oxygen, would be a great evolutionary driver to things that could tolerate oxygen. Absolutely. Rise of oxygen gives you the rise of diversity and multicellularity. The, uh, the iron had to go, but also the iron reacts with uh, I mean, sorry, the oxygen reacts with the carbon compounds as well. It's carbonates and things like that. So as the, uh, and uh, oxidations of the minerals in the rocks, these all get buried. Uh, but there's a cycle as they uh, rise and get weathered that gets released back into the atmosphere. So there's a, a long-term cycle there as well. And uh, later on, when the iron is gone, there still is a reaction with all the carbon because uh, uh, or the animals take the carbon and, and make carbon dioxide out of it by burning it with oxygen. So there's a balance between oxygen utilization and plants making the oxygen. And you had to bury lots of amounts, large amounts of carbon containing uh, organisms to allow oxygen to build up to large levels. I think when we get to the last slide or two, you'll see what I mean by that. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Joe Lamana discussing the origin of life and prokaryotic cells, those lacking a distinct nucleus. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Lamana discusses the origin of mitochondria and of eukaryotic cells, those with nuclei. Now, back to the talk. This is the, uh, this is probably, this is the heart of the talk. Uh, this is the origin of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the cell's engine. That's where all cells, uh, all eukaryote, eukaryote cells means they have a nucleus. Uh, all multicellular organisms are eukaryotic. Uh, all animals, all plants, all, all fungi are all uh, organisms that have mitochondria. And the mitochondria that they have are all related. That's why uh, 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 we know that this event uh, occurred only once and we all have the same related uh, mitochondria. So let's move along. Um, all cells need energy to function. Uh, all cells use the same organelle. That's the mitochondria. And the uh, 
kind of the currency, the energy currency of the biology is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So it has a high energy phosphate on the third one, and enzymes that can take that phosphate off also get a lot of energy from it, and ATP becomes a DP, diphosphate from triphosphate, and you get a lot of energy from it. And the mitochondria takes the ADP, makes ATP for us. And it looks something like this, kind of looks like a bacterium, and, and that was obvious to the people uh, who first saw them. Uh, it's double membraned uh, organism, like a bacterial cell, and it's got its own genetic material in it, uh, as well as the ability to make its own proteins. It's got ribosomes and uh, the ability to make its own proteins. I'll talk more about how it, this works a little bit later in part three. But in most, in all uh, typical eukaryotic cells, have the nucleus, which is number two here, followed by uh, number five, which is a lot of the protein-making uh, machinery. This is the Golgi apparatus. And, but here's our, our friend, the mitochondrion, which is uh, providing the energy for all the work done by the eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells are uh, about 10 times bigger than uh, bacteria, because bacteria are about the same size as mitochondria. So you get an idea of uh, the size orientation. They were originally seen uh, by uh, histologists who uh, were, and these are just barely at the edge of visibility in a light uh, level microscope. And uh, people like Altman thought they, looked, they thought they looked like bacteria. He it wasn't sure whether they were bacteria, but they looked like bacteria. He referred to them as bioblasts. Uh, later, they were named mitochondria which uh, from the Greek, which means thread-like granules, because uh, as uh, Benda looked at it, he saw that they were, that they were connected with little uh, uh, bulges on them, looked like a thread that had granules uh, along it. Uh, and it was known from uh, uh, biological dyes that uh, they were uh, associated with uh, living cells. You couldn't stain them if the cell was dead, but if the cell was alive, they took up this, uh, this dye. And it, because of that, it was suggested that they were involved in, in the oxygen respiration, that is, the utilization of oxygen to make energy. And it was really confirmed in the, uh, uh, after uh, World War II by Leninger, who wrote the classic textbook on biochemistry, that indeed this is the organelle that makes ATP from um, uh, oxygen and substrate. Uh, there's a whole story involved in the uh, electron transport chain that's uh, uh, maybe for another time. Now, um, in the, in the mid-60s, uh, Lynn Margulis uh, proposed uh, that these mitochondria not only looked like bacteria, but they must have come from, they must be bacteria. And so she proposed the bacterial origin of uh, mitochondria and uh, was able to publish uh, her uh, paper in the uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology in 1967 using her married name. She was uh, married to Carl Sagan. So uh, Lynn Sagan. Uh, published this. It was rejected in 14 journals before it was published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology uh, because it was a crazy idea of mitochondria coming from bacteria. Um, but they look like bacteria. They have the same uh, genetic base pair distribution. Uh, uh, eukaryotic cells have more of the AT base pair uh, than the CG, but bacterial and mitochondrial DNA have equal amounts of uh, uh, those pairs. Uh, they have no histones. They don't fold up. Uh, they have a different ribosome to make protein from. And in every case, the bacterial and the mitochondrial are identical. So we have come to understand that uh, uh, Lynn Margulis was indeed correct and bacterial. Uh, uh, mitochondria started out as bacteria. And the idea was an RK. Uh, uh, a prote, uh, it's another uh, prokaryote, but not a bacterium, an archaea, it's a different domain of life, had different characteristics, uh, was engulfed a proteobacterium. The proteobacterium was able to resist the digestive uh, uh, attempts of the archaea, and then a symbiotic relationship occurred. They had different metabolic uh, 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 processes that turned out to be synergistic. Uh, this may or may not have happened quite a few times, but at least one time it worked so well that it dominated uh, life from then on. So 
the, uh, you have the, uh, uh, the generation of the first eukaryote cell, and it required a nucleus to, to occur to uh, sequester the DNA from the host cell so that it wouldn't mix up too badly with the DNA from the bacterium. But a lot of eukaryote uh, DNA uh, comes from bacterial sources. Um, quick note on just on the DNA uh, differences. A uh, nuclear DNA made with base pairs, coils, and then coils again, and then the coils coil, and the coils coil again. Uh, and it's covered with histones that keep it from uh, just generating uh, all kinds of mRNA until it's needed. Whereas bacterial cells like this E. coli uh, have these uh, plasmids, these kind of circles of DNA that are uh, uh, same as mitochondria. Now the nuclear DNA, each, in each cell, a uh, uh, human cell, there's about 10 feet of DNA if you stretch it out in each cell. So you took all your DNA and stretched out uh, end to end, you could go uh, back and forth to the moon 70 times. That's a lot of DNA coiled up very tightly uh, in each cell. Uh, on the other hand, and there's only one copy per cell. In mitochondria, mitochondria have uh, smaller genomes, only 13 genes. They've, uh, those bacteria that became mitochondria have lost a lot of their genes. And there's uh, five to 10 copies these plasmids in each mitochondrion, and there's multiple mitochondria, maybe hundreds per cell. Uh, so there's a lot of copies of the mitochondrial genome that a mitochondria can divide uh, independently, uh, uh, and the, the copies of the DNA can be um, uh, reproduced uh, fairly quickly compared to the nuclear DNA. So as I say, the mitochondrial genome, it's a kind of a circular plasmid type DNA, and it has uh, uh, 13 to 20 genes that are the minimum required for the mitochondria to control certain of its functions uh, locally. The reason it does it is that uh, sometimes the, the mitochondria can be very far from the cell nucleus. Imagine a nerve cell where the nucleus is in the spinal cord and the uh, axon goes all the way down to the big toe. Uh, that's a long distance away from the nucleus if you depend upon the nucleus to be making the proteins you need and also to be able to respond to local energy demand, uh, you need local control. So the other significance of uh, mitochondrial DNA is, uh, you know, we get all our uh, mitochondria from our mothers. The egg uh, has the mitochondria, the sperm uses all the mitochondria it has as energy to get to the egg, uh, and then, but only one set of mitochondria are left. Um, uh, and uh, we can use that evidence to look at, by looking at rates of mitochondrial uh, 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 mutation, to predict when the first human mitochondria appeared. And that would have been in our, uh, in our maternal line, so we call uh, that first human Eve, and we think maybe it was 170,000 years ago. Although there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's, it's not a, a done story by any means. And also mitochondria help control uh, what we call apoptosis. This is a Greek word that refers to things like where the leaves fall off the trees in the autumn. It's a, uh, a programmed cell death, uh, or it's like a cell suicide. And this is triggered when the energy capacity or the energy uh, 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 system, the mitochondria get so damaged that they can no longer provide energy for the cell, then it triggers the death of the cell so that it can be phagocytized and uh, doesn't uh, gum up the work, so to speak. And it's very, also very important to study the mitochondrial DNA as we get towards understanding mitochondrial aging. Um, and uh, Nick Lane, who is a, a, a good scientist and a, also a good writer, this is an interesting book on the subject, if you're interested, called Power, Sex, and Suicide, uh, and it's all about mitochondria. Uh, and uh, he's pointing out that the, uh, uh, that the uh, fact that uh, uh, life occurred almost immediately when it was available in its single cell form was not that remarkable, but multicellularity depended upon a unique event and that is a synergistic uh, uh, endosymbiosis to have occurred. Once it occurred, it only happened that once. All Mit well, mitochondria are related. We think it comes from purple bacteria. Uh, 
These have a, uh, a chlorophyll-like substance. They, uh, they have different colors uh, in them. They, don't, uh, they can't live with oxygen. They use sulfur as their, uh, uh, for their energy system. Uh, and the other side of it is the uh, archaea. These are the, what would be called the pioneer organism in the iron sulfur world theory. Uh, these are, make uh, methane. These are methanogens, meaning they make methane. They get their energy from CO2 and hydrogen. But the problem is hydrogen is scarce, so finding uh, sources of hydrogen uh, is crucial for these uh, cells. They're, they're not bacteria and they're not eukaryotes. They have a, a different cell membrane. It's polysaccharidic. And they're, they can go anywhere because they make their own energy from, uh, uh, from light or from uh, chemical processes. And these are some of the uh, places where they occur. Um, these are the black smokers. Uh, they're black because they have uh, sulfur compounds. They are, exist near magma uh, in the deep ocean trenches. This is where the uh, continents are pulling apart. The plates are moving apart. Uh, magma heats the water, uh, spews uh, all kinds of minerals here. It's very rich in minerals. There's no oxygen, but there's plenty of uh, other sources of chemical energy. And of course, you have thermal energy. Uh, and if you look at the one on the right, uh, there's uh, tube worms uh, and uh, what are called squat lobsters. I don't know, but these are deep sea vents located maybe uh, uh, at two and three kilometers depth. So 100 uh, uh, atmospheres pressure, where the, the water may be four or 500 degrees. In the case of the black smoker, it's still liquid because of the pressure. So it's, it, it's, uh, it's, and it's a very acidic environment. Um, the, um, uh, that was for the black smokers. I just said most of this. The first one was discovered in 1977 as these underwater submarines started looking at uh, mapping the uh, seabed. Uh, is a source of the iron uh, and nickel, the reduced forms, and uh, chemosynthetic bacteria live in these. Uh, um, this one didn't come up. There it is. Uh, the white smoker. Um, this is, uh, these were discovered only in 2000. These are a little further away from the trench, so the water is cooler. These are steam that's bubbling up through the rock instead of big holes uh, they're from little porous uh, labyrinthine uh, tubes, uh, which produce lots of surface area for chemical reactions to occur. Uh, and uh, um, they're uh, more uh, alkaline than acidic. And uh, it's thought that uh, these, uh, uh, the, the life that's here represents some of the uh, organisms that we're familiar with. Uh, lots of barium, calcium, silicon. Uh, they make uh, serpentinite. This is a, uh, a, a, a compound of iron and magnesium and uh, uh, barium and calcium uh, that uh, has green, uh, looks like green snakes running through it. Um, today you can find these type of archaea in uh, places like Yellowstone National Park. Uh, Yellowstone National Park, uh, this is one of the geysers. Well, it's a, a, a hot spring, and it shows the um, steam coming out of the center of it here, yeah. But all along the side, this color, the orange color, is coming from the uh, uh, algae, the bacteria, and the archaea. And these are, the, like, again, like the purple bacteria, these are carotenoids and bacterial chlorophylls, and the colors change with the temperature and the seasons. And so sometimes they're uh, more purple or green, and sometimes more orange, depends on the uh, conditions. Very, very colorful. So um, uh, basically, in part two, what we have is we have the, the event that occurred. Uh, we have the uh, uh, last eukaryotic uh, common ancestor. That is the eukaryote cell that joined an archaea with a proteobacterium that became the, the precursor cell of all eukaryotes uh, uh, going uh, towards the future. And uh, all these, there are three uh, domains of life, the bacterial domain, the archaean domain, and the eukaryote domain. And the eukaryote domain 
produces plants, uh, animals, uh, fungi, uh, and all life from eukaryote domain has mitochondria. That allows them to take advantage of the uh, changes in the environment that were occurring and to uh, grow into multicellular organisms and animals. So I would stop here and take some questions about um, mitochondrial origins. What has to happen to the bacteria? The one thing it has to be able to resist being digested is food by the uh, archaean uh, engulfer. Um, and then it has to uh, keep from poisoning the genes of the archaean. Remember, the archaean engulfer doesn't have a nucleus, and so its genes are floating around. And now when the bacterial releases their genes, they get mixed up. And most of the time, that's going to be disastrous. And so a lot of those engulfments that would normally have occurred are going to be uh, worthless, uh, uh, damaging rather than productive. So it had to be a very tricky event that occurred that allowed the uh, bacteria to first survive and then figure out how to keep its DNA from getting too mixed up with the other cell's DNA. Have scientists now been able to do this in a, laborator a laboratory setting, put an archaean and a, a proteobacteria together? Yeah. Actually, that has been seen in nature and in the lab. They haven't made mitochondria, but there are examples of uh, symbiotic, uh, endosymbiotic uh, uh, organisms existing today. Oh, could you make a comment about the variation in the structure of mitochondria of one species compared to another? Uh, and, and this refers again to this question of mitochondrial Eve, um, yeah. you know, and whether, you know, you can have a continuous feed of mitochondria from other species into another. Mitochondria are uh, more similar than they are different. Uh, the genes that encode the local proteins and also the a lot of the proteins that come from the nucleus, those genes can vary. But the, but the proteins that they're producing are uh, identical. So almost all mitochondria are just mitochondria. Now there's local changes that can, can change uh, them uh, uh, to a certain extent, but they, have about the, they all have the cytochrome chain, the electron transport chain. They have about the same density of energy production, the same sizes. They're, they're more similar than, than people are similar to each other, mitochondria, from all different organisms. Uh, by looking at uh, the ultrastructure picture of a mitochondrion, you couldn't tell where it came from. When, when they do uh, investigation, like for my sister's or brother, we share the same mito mitochondria, right? You got from your mother, yes. From my mother, right. So. When you go back to Eve, right, and we go back to all these various things that the, you know, anthropologists find at the Natural History Museum, those those humans, do they have the same mitochondria, or that 170,000 year thing is so, set in stone, and you cannot? So every once in a while, there would be a, a mutation that would change one of the base pairs. Uh, and might not affect the protein too much. It might be in a non-coding area, just like in the nuclear uh, uh, genome. So you can watch that. You, you can look at that going backwards. You get the uh, types, uh, and, and you can follow the changes in, in the populations of mitochondria going back. You can see how often the change occurs, and then you can predict how far back the first one had to be uh, for this particular lineage. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Joe Lamana. Dr. Lamana is a Janet M. and Joseph S. Silber Professor for the Study of Brain Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned how early bacteria were taken up by prokaryotic cells and eventually became the cellular powerhouses we know as mitochondria. In our final segment, Dr. Lamana will discuss the role of oxygen and mitochondria in the evolution of multicellular organisms. Now, back to our talk. All right, let's move to uh, part three then. And uh, 
this involves, uh, it's a little jumpier, it's got the role of mitochondria, so we've got some examples of how mitochondria participate, uh, and the role of oxygen as the mitochondrial partner in, uh, in uh, evolution and in uh, extreme uh, examples of uh, energy consumption. So here's our mitochondrion again. Um, and the, uh, what we're going to talk about is to show uh, how the mitochondrion can go about generating energy in a, uh, in a very uh, 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 outline form that I think it will make it uh, understandable. Basically what the mitochondrion does is it takes the hydrogen that we get from eating food and it burns it with oxygen that we get from breathing it in from the atmosphere. And when you burn the hydrogen with the oxygen, you get a tremendous amount of energy from that. Uh, and that energy then gets transferred into ATP molecules that the cells can then use to do the work of the cell. So the first step is getting the hydrogen. That's done through uh, the uh, TCA, tricarboxylic acid cycle, that was, this, that was worked out by Hans Krebs, Sir Hans Krebs in Oxford, and sometimes called the Krebs cycle. And I'm showing Sir Hans in a, in a standard biochemistry joke of Hans Krebs riding a cycle, so it could be Hans cycle, Krebs cycle. Uh, it's required of all biochemists, I think, to make that joke. Uh, but basically, the hydrogen from sugar comes in, it's converted through this cycle of uh, compounds and enzymes, uh, and the hydrogen is transferred to the mitochondrion, and this is where the carbon dioxide comes from. So in changing, getting the hydrogen from the food, the carbon dioxide is pulled off the molecules, so we have breathe out the carbon dioxide, and the hydrogen is passed on to the mitochondrion. And then here's where the magic occurs. We have a number of compartments in the mitochondrion. So that, let me spend just a few minutes with this uh, diagram. It's, a, it's two membranes, two membranes. An outer membrane, that's here. Number two is the outer membrane, and an inner membrane. And that means that there's then two spaces that are important. There's the intermembrane space between the inner and outer membrane, and then there's the space that is completely uh, surrounded by the inner membrane. We call this the matrix. And it's in the matrix that the Krebs cycle is working to make the hydrogen available. And that, the cytochrome chain, which is a number of these proteins lined up one after another, the job that they do is to separate the electron from the proton, because hydrogen is a proton and electron. And so <clears throat> the hydrogen uh, proton goes out into the intermembrane space, and the electron goes passed on to the next member of the cytochrome chain. At the end of that chain is a molecule called cytochrome oxidase. It looks very similar to hemoglobin. It has a pocket that oxygen can bind to. And the oxygen binds in that uh, pocket of the cytochrome oxidase. The electrons come streaming down, and when four reach it, it turns the oxygen into water. It reduces the oxygen to water. And so the, as you have oxygen there, it pulls the electrons through. And as it pulls the electrons through, the hydrogen is pumped out. What good is that? Well, because you have now a big difference between the amount of hydrogen in the intermembrane space and almost none in the matrix, that hydrogen c creates a concentration gradient. And it comes pouring in through this very specialized pore which is an ATP synthase. And as it comes down, the energy in that gradient is used to make ATP from ADP. And that's the magic. This is, in reality, each mitochondrion acts as a hydrogen fuel cell. If you're familiar with hydrogen batteries uh, and you know how much energy you can get out of it, you can run a Tesla from <laughs> hydrogen batteries, essentially, right? Uh, so this is the same uh, idea, that is hydrogen uh, is separated into electrons that flow through the electric circuit, and then the protons are used to, or the electrons uh, as they flow through are, you, are drawn away by the oxygen to make water, and you have your uh, fuel cell, your battery, your hydrogen battery. Okay, so what's the advantage? Suppose you just burn sugar in the case of 
uh, without oxygen. So no oxygen, this is just sugar being used to make some energy. You get two ATP for an amount of sugar, say. And uh, if you're a bacterium or a, a penicillin mold or something like that, you could do just about what a mold can do, not much, although they do a good job on that bread. Uh, lactic acid is the end point, and this is, you know, if you exercise strongly, uh, you get into an oxygen debt and you build up lactic acid, well, you, you know that, that you can't keep running. Uh, you need to stop and get oxygen to replace the uh, energy. Uh, the burning the sugar with oxygen gives you almost 20 times as much ATP as you get from uh, running it without oxygen. It's a huge energy advantage, uh, 20 times the amount of energy, and uh, this allows the cell to do a lot more than a prokaryote can do uh, without the uh, oxygen burning ability. Uh, I have that little uh, marshmallow in there just to remind me, to give you an example of the amount of energy in sugar when you burn it. If you've, you've, you've burned your marshmallows over your campfires, it catches fire and it burns pretty well. There's a lot of energy in sugar when you burn it with, uh, with oxygen. Of course, the cell takes it in small pieces and turns that into ATP rather than let it uh, burn like that. And nature takes the mitochondria and it puts it where it needs to be inside the cell. This is another example of, uh, of how a, uh, the different cells uh, evolve their different structures in order to uh, do the function that they're required and provide the energy to do that function. So this is a, a mitochondrion that sits inside a muscle cell. Those striations in top and bottom are the, uh, are the uh, uh, muscle fibers that are going to use the energy produced by the mitochondrion. And each mitochondrion essentially produces the same, pretty much the same amount of energy, it has about the same components. So you, if you look at the volume of mitochondria, you can get a pretty good idea of the ability of the cell to generate. You know how much energy you can ge generate. And I have a couple of uh, examples here that I think are pretty impressive. The, uh, on the left, you have uh, a muscle from a mako shark. And it's, uh, these are muscle fibers that are cut in cross section. They're going in and out of the board. And right next to each one of them are these uh, mitochondria. So these are mitochondria. This is the muscle cell. This is the mitochondria. Um, very close and a lot of volume. So you have essentially looks like pretty much the similar amount of volume in mitochondria producing the energy as you have in the muscle cells that are producing the work. This might be similar to thinking about an electric car that has half the weight of it as batteries uh, in order to do what it has to do. The other, and so this is a uh, shark muscle, so it's a cartilaginous uh, fish. Uh, but on the other side, we have a mammalian uh, tissue. It's a uh, heart muscle, cardiac muscle, happens to be from a mouse, but it's pretty much similar. Here, these are the, uh, the lines of the muscle, so those are the ones that are pulling apart and going together. And these are all mitochondria sit in the middle of these uh, fibers of the heart. This is the nucleus of the heart muscle. Here's a pile of mitochondria. Cardiac muscle, about 40% of the volume is mitochondria. That's about, uh, and there's a, maybe half of it or a little more maybe is the, is the striated muscle. But the ratio is, uh, is uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, in brain tissue, for example, that ratio is about 10% of that volume is uh, mitochondrial. So it shows you the difference in the energy requirements, uh, brain versus uh, heart. Now this is probably my, my favorite one. This is a hummingbird flight muscle. Hummingbird that beats 300 times a second and can stop and hover in the air. And these, uh, this is really impressive. These are capillaries. And here's the mitochondria between the capillaries is a nucleus of a cell. And there's the muscle cells. Here you have more mitochondria than you have muscle. That makes sense if you think about it, right? And here's a close-up on a capillary. It's a cell in the middle of that capillary. And it's filled, surrounded by mitochondria. Here's what's using oxygen, what's producing the ATP. Here's the muscle. 
thin strand of muscle completely surrounded by uh, mitochondria. So it's, it's pretty impressive and you can understand how uh, the hummingbird can accomplish what it does, how the shark can accomplish what it was, how the heart can accomplish what it has to do for, for that length of time that you, that you need it to work. All right, so let's go move on a little bit now and talk about the multicellular organisms. In a way, it's a little backward, but what I did is I showed you what the capabilities of the system is once you can provide the energy. And here's how it impacts things like uh, 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 evolution. If you're an organism and you're working at the substrate level, that's making lactate, say, without having the advantage of making oxygen, your energy providing system is uh, only about 10% efficient. It's not much, 10%. That means if you had a predator come along and want to take advantage of the energy that you have and it grabs you and it's 10% efficient, now it becomes 1%. 10% of 10% is 1%. And that's not, a, that's not a good deal. It costs more to do the engulfing and the digesting than you get out of it. So there's very little predation at the level of single cell organisms uh, that are prokaryotic. But with oxidative phosphorylation that allows you to use oxygen to generate energy, you're around 40% efficient. Now, now the first person in the chain gets grabbed by the next person. It's 40% of 40%, and then 40%, 40%, 40%, and you could develop a chain at least six uh, layers deep before you run below 1% uh, uh, of the energy supply left. That means that predators now have an advantage, can gain an advantage in their competition with other organisms. And the bigger the cell then, the better the predator. So predation tends to produce larger and larger cells or organisms. And prey doesn't sit around waiting to be preyed on. It does the same strategy and starts getting bigger for protection. Uh, so when, once you have this uh, efficiency in the chain, then you have uh, uh, the ability to really stimulate uh, growth and diversity and development. So why didn't bacteria get larger? They had two billion years before the event that made uh, mitochondria. Uh, and that's because the way prokaryotes work, their energy producing system, those, that prokaryote uh, bacterial cell that went to become the mitochondria, was still making energy based upon its own surface area. And if it got bigger, its energy requirements would grow with the volume by the cube, but its ability to make energy would only grow by the square root of the surface area. So it's not a good strategy. But once you put the mitochondrion inside the cell, you can add mitochondria, you really could add them, and then your energy production capacity will grow with the volume of the cell, but your utilization for most cells can be, uh, are, is related to the surface area. And that's a much more favorable relationship. So bacteria, we're not going to be able to get anywhere with a 10% energy efficiency, and they couldn't grow larger anyway because of surface volume uh, uh, considerations. And uh, bacteria are very successful in their niche, but it's a simple solution, and it's not going to get complex. They work very well, and the su successful bacteria are the ones that can divide fastest, and that means you can't have a lot of genes because that takes time to reproduce your genes. So the smaller the number of genes you have, the faster you can uh, reproduce and the more successful you are. So the prokaryote uh, philosophy, the prokaryote uh, uh, strategy keeps the cells simple and small. And successful, but simple and small. Until you get mitochondria, you can't get complexity. Now let's look at the uh, more modern part of the oxygen curve in the last minute or so. Um, and this represents oxygen variations that we know closer to our own time. This is half a, half a billion years. This is from essentially the Cambrian explosion of life on to present day. And if you plot in the yellow curve there, oxygen levels, you see it's not constant. It varies up and down. 
And what we now know from this up and down is that the rates of evolutionary diversity and the die-off uh, in the extinctions are related uh, in a great measure to the oxygen uh, history. So that at times when oxygen is rising, you have increase in diversity, uh, taking advantage of the, uh, everything that oxygen can give you in terms of energy from the mitochondria. But when oxygen becomes limiting, then the inefficient forms die off. Uh, there's one particular, there's a lot of information here, but I want to focus on this one here, this peak. This is when oxygen reached about 35% in the atmosphere. From, remember, today it's 21%. There was 35%. That's as mu uh, it's a maximum because any more than that, and it, uh, the, the forest would burn, and you wouldn't be producing more oxygen. So there's a limit. Um, and that's it, right? Oh, okay. So... Uh, um, at that time, you had uh, a higher density in the atmosphere because that was all extra oxygen, and you allowed the gigantic uh, insects and flying insects uh, and that. The uh, only thing I had uh, left to try to get through is just to give you some idea of what the human body does, and we produce about 85 watts of energy, uh, about a good strong light bulb, and uh, we use about... Uh, uh, 150 balloons worth of uh, air per day, and we produce a half liter of water from metabolism every day. And the mitochondria in our body make uh, uh, essentially 100 pounds of ATP every day by cycling ADP. That's about half the body's weight uh, of ATP uh, cycling. And that's, that's the strength of the mitochondria. And with that, I will uh, this just summarize what we said, and I'll say thanks and ask for final questions. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.